بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام على أمين الله على وحيه وعزائم أمره الخاتم لما سبق والفاتح لما استقبل والمهيمن على ذلك كله ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام على صاحب السكينة السلام على المدفون بالمدينة السلام على المنصور المؤيد السلام على أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One day, a young man descends from the mountain top. He comes down from a cave that he used to meditate and to offer prayers and acts of worship to the Lord of his forefathers. When he came down off of that mountain, he delivered a message that for the next 23 years would change the course of history. 23 years later, he ascended the pulpit for one last time. And he delivered his last farewell. Between these two stations, the moment when he stepped off the mountain and the moment when he ascended the pulpit for the last time, what happened? What is it that made the Prophet of Islam, the Holy Messenger of God, the Prophet Muhammad, May the peace and blessings of the Almighty Allah be upon him and upon his immaculate family. What was his secret? What made the message so special? How was he able to influence not only the pagan Arabs who inhabited the barren deserts of Arabia, but to disseminate his knowledge and to promote a new culture that would affect the world in almost every single dimension. Well, there are many secrets to the success of the Prophet of Islam, but perhaps one can point out a few that stand out in any such discussion. And one of the greatest things about the Messenger of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, was the fact that his message was based on the intellect, it was based on logic, it was based on rationale, it wasn't based on superstition. He never tried to promote any kind of uh, anti-scientific or illogical or irrational thought in order to prove a point. In fact, to the contrary, it may amaze you to know how the Prophet was always a very strong proponent of logic and science, even when it wasn't um, exactly expedient, even when it wasn't uh, exactly uh, in his interest to do so. For instance, one day the Prophet had a son whose name was Ibrahim. His mother was a, a woman named Maria or Mariah. Uh, Al-Qibtiya, who was originally a Coptic Christian from Egypt and the Prophet married her and had his first and only son, Ibrahim. Ibrahim was only a year and a half old when God revealed to his messenger that uh, your son is going to die. The Prophet grieved, he cried, but he submitted to the will of God. Ibrahim was taken from him. When Ibrahim died, obviously there was a lot of commotion, people uh, empathized and sympathized with the Prophet. But here's what's really interesting. At the very same time, there was a solar eclipse in Mecca and in Medina. So there were those who were skeptical of the Prophet's message, the pagans or the hypocrites, who had not fully submitted to the religion of Islam. And so you can imagine these people coming from this culture 
and uh, basically coming out of the womb of the pre-Islamic pagan era, which was based on pure superstitions, one began to tell the other that maybe this prophet is telling the truth, maybe he is a prophet and a messenger of God, because his son dies and suddenly you have a solar eclipse. Now, put yourself in that position. There are skeptics and there are cynics and there are people who are not willing to believe you. Suddenly, out of sheer coincidence, they begin to question the merits of their position and therefore uh, they, they, they exhibit the possibility of perhaps embracing his message as a result of that. But not the Prophet of Islam not the messenger of Allah, not Muhammad. He's not the kind of person who would take advantage of this feeble-mindedness and of, uh, of, 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 of their uh, tendency to believe in, in superstition. Do you know what he did? Any other liar or an imposter or anyone who was claiming to be a messenger of God falsely would have definitely taken advantage of this situation, but not him. He immediately calls for communal, congregational prayers at the mosque. Everyone attends. Uh, it was a, almost a, a declaration or an announcement that the Prophet has an important message to deliver. Everyone came to the mosque to hear what he had to offer. He ascends the pulpit and he says to the people, Ayyuhan hey, Nas, O oh people, the moon and the sun are signs of God. An eclipse, whether it's solar or lunar, they're also signs from God. They denote special messages and they communicate certain things with the people. But they have nothing to do with the death of my son. The sun and the moon are never ec eclipsed over someone's death. And so do not associate this incident, the fact my son would, uh, uh, had, has just died, with the solar eclipse that you've just witnessed. These two are not related in any way, shape, or form. Imagine, here's a man who's true to his word. Here's a man who dispels superstition, even at his own expense, even at the expense of getting more followers to submit to him. One of the greatest, to sum up what I'm trying to say here, one of the greatest elements of the Prophet's message was the fact that it was based on logic. قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ Allah says in the Holy Qur'an. He says, listen, you and us, we might disagree, but here's how we settle all of these disagreements. We settle disagreements based on logic. We, base, uh, we settle those disagreements based on proof. And we settle disagreements based on evidence. We do not resort to superstition. We do, do not resort to violence. We do not resort to any kind of... Uh, act which is, which is antithetical to rationale and to the intellect. What we are looking for is an intellectual discourse and that's the most beautiful thing about the Messenger of Islam. In fact, when the Prophet was coming towards the holy city of Mecca, his own birthplace, to reclaim it after 13 years of being forced into exile, the Prophet then comes back as a victor. He now has an army of tens of thousands of Muslims. He's, he's nothing like the Prophet when he left the holy city of Mecca, where he was all alone. All he had was his own uh, brother and cousin and son-in-law and successor, Imam Ali. And he had some women and some children. Uh, but now the Prophet is going back as a victor. And he's, he's, he's now powerful. Though before he does that, he performs the Hajj and he performs uh, uh, the, the Umrah, the pilgrimage to the house of the Lord. It, it is said that Abu Sufyan, who was the leader of the idolaters, he was the chief architect of all of the wars against the Messenger of Allah, one of the most vile um, enemies and arch foes of the Prophet of Islam. Someone who ultimately ended up uh, claiming to embrace his message when he realized that the only way he was going to fight this re religion was to infiltrate it and was to destroy it from within. 
At that time though, Abu Sufyan was still openly uh, uh, polytheist and pagan and a rejecter of God. So he went out and he observed as the Prophet was performing the pilgrimage. And one of the rites of the pilgrimage, one of the rituals that are performed, is that one is required to shave their head. So the Prophet was shaving his head and he's observing from a distance. Traditions tell us that as he was watching, he noticed something completely peculiar, something out of this world. He noticed that as the Prophet was having his head shaved, people were rushing to take whatever hair uh, that was falling. And he says, I, I noticed that not a single hair strand fell to the ground. Muslims were queuing up and uh, everyone was trying to get as many hairs as possible and they would be distributing these strands of hair amongst themselves for the sheer blessing of having uh, a, a hair, even a single strand of the Messenger of God. The Prophet then went to perform the ablution, the ritual purity where one washes his face, his hands, um, wipes his head and wipes his feet. And when the Prophet was taking the water to wash his hands and his face, um, there, were, there were drops of water that would fall to the ground. And again, he noticed that Muslims would rush to, to take those uh, drops of water that fell from the Prophet's hands and, and take them as blessings and wipe their faces with it and to drink those drops of water. When he saw that, he, turns, he turned around and he went straight back to his people in Mecca and he said, you know what? We have to, we have to surrender to this man. We don't stand a chance of achieving any kind of victory. There's no way we can defeat this man because the level of love and respect that he enjoys in the hearts of thousands is simply unprecedented. We've never seen anything like it. We've seen respect. A lot of people might respect celebrities or they, they might respect um, their politicians or they could respect their teachers or parents, but I've never seen anything like this. So he told his, his people, the pagans, and he told them, listen, this is my advice to you. Just lay down your arms, raise your hands, carry a white flag and say, you know what, whatever you say. And that's exactly what they did. When the Prophet came back to Mecca, the Holy Messenger of Allah did not engage in war. Not a single drop of blood was shed. It was uh, the perfect battle. The Prophet came and he simply took over the city and once they brought all of these people who had uh, caused so much heartache and so much pain and so much misery and had, had, had killed so many Muslims uh, during the course of those early years of, of Islam, they brought them all as captives to the Messenger of God and the Prophet looked at them and he said, you know what, you are released. Um, go, for you have been released from captivity. I shall not hold you to account for what you have done. What you have done is between you and your Lord. It's between you and God. Uh, as for me, I am not here to seek vengeance. I am not here to kill anyone. I'm not here to, 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 to demolish any homes. I am not here to raise the city to the ground. I am a prophet of mercy. I am a messenger of God's good word. I am here to deliver a positive message, the message of peace, the message of prosperity, both in this world as well as in the hereafter. Say, there is no God but Allah, and you shall be kings both in this world as well as in the hereafter. In other words, you'll be able to live fulfilling, happy, prosperous lives in this world free from contamination, free from filth, free from things that are deemed impure. Just think about the message of Islam. What are the things that Muslims are prevented from eating? You know, again, we're just taking a very uh, simple example here. Muslim dietary habits seem bizarre to many people, but just think about the things that, w that we've been forbidden from eating. We're we've been for forbidden from eating dogs, from eating pigs. And anyone who's ever seen a pig in, in real life, in the zoo for instance, will know exactly why we avoid eating pigs. Because pigs are dirty. Because pigs are 
are, are animals that are uh, very impure. It's the kind of animal that eats its own um, excrement. It's an animal that devours its own children. I mean, this is not the type of animal that you would want to eat. You are what you eat, as the saying goes. And as Muslims, we say, you know what? We're not going to eat an animal that devours its own children, that, that eats its own excrement, that has such a high level of, uh, uh, of contaminant, contaminants in its, in, its, in its body. We're just not going to do that. What we will eat is something that's pure. And, and, and lamb is, is one of those uh, meats that obviously it's taken from, from sheep, and sheep are, they eat grass um, in, instead of all of, these, uh, all of these repulsive things. They eat grass, which is beautiful. They're, they're vegetarians. What else are we not allowed to eat? We're not allowed to eat, and I say this because the Quran says, أَحَلَّ لَكُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ God has made permissible for you things that are good, things that are pure, things that are delicious. What else? Blood. Muslims are not allowed to drink blood, even if it's a single drop, which makes perfect sense. Muslims are not allowed to drink urine, excrement, semen. I mean, these things, as disgusting as they sound, and it might sound uh, obvious to, to many people, but it wasn't so obvious 14 centuries ago. And, and yet the, the religion of Islam came with the Holy Prophet of God to say, you know what? You're better than that. You're human beings. And as human beings, you're endowed with the intellect which allows you to tell the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil, and between what is pure and beautiful and nutritious and what is essentially disgusting. You're much better than that. Just look at the group of things that we've been banned from eating or prohibited from eating. The Prophet came to say, if you are Muslim, if you embrace this beautiful religion, you will be able to live happy and lead fulfilling lives in this world as well as in the hereafter. In the hereafter, the rewards that have been promised to those who submit to the will of God. And again, this isn't exclusive to Muslims. If a non-Muslim observes the rules of Islam, they will benefit from them in this world as well as in the hereafter. In fact, we have a narration by the Holy Messenger of God that says that if a complete non-Muslim becomes a teetotaler and avoids alcohol, and there are people out there who do that. In fact, I know there are Hollywood celebrities who are smart enough to know that when they consume alcoholic beverages and they get intoxicated when they get drunk they lose their most precious capital and that's their ability to think their ability to 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 rationally deduce things and, and make the right choices so the the prophetic narration says that if a non-muslim even one who does not believe in everything else that islam has to say avoids alcohol god will reward them for this act their lives will be more fulfilling and happier in this world and they'll be rewarded in the hereafter perhaps as well. Join us next time in this series as we continue to explore the beautiful character and the exquisite teachings of the Holy Messenger of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.